Welcome to Inaudible. My name is Jeremy Wylan, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ryan Masterson. On this podcast, we discuss the weird, beautiful channeled messages found in the archives of LL Research, an organization dedicated to sharing spiritual information with the world. You can find out more about LL Research at llresearch.org. The archives contain transcripts of messages from allegedly discarnate sources who claim to hail from an organization they call the Confederation of Planets in service to the Infinite Creator. If you would like an audio version of the transcripts, please subscribe to Ryan's other podcast, Living Love and Light, available on all platforms. Ryan and I will try to provide analysis and commentary on the philosophy described in these messages, identifying the common themes, and grappling with the application of this information to our human lives. Thanks for joining us on this journey. Ryan, good morning. How's the journey going? Good morning. The journey is going. It is going. Not always forward, sometimes sideways, but always going. How is yep. the journey going for you? What if that was the standard? <laughs> what if that was a standard greeting? Hola, how how are you? How is the journey? <laughs> the We'd have world. to take ourselves a lot more seriously, and I'm not sure. Not sure we need that. <laughs> Not all the time, at least. I think a lot of people could could uh, lighten up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like the type A's. Like you know, maybe you're not on a journey. Everybody else, hey, yeah. Let's, uh, let's go on it. Let's go on. Uh, let's let's be door explore door the explorer today. You know, for real. <laughs> some people. It's funny yeah. how. Yeah, it's it's a judgment, of course. It's a judgment, but some people can lighten up, and others could really use. <laughs> putting their nose to the grind on something, you know? Yeah, I guess. But I guess that's a part of the journey. But anyway, how it's are you? A part of my journey is figuring out how to apply, you know, mm. speaking of discipline last week. Sure. A big part of my journey is learning how to apply my will because I feel like I am a, you know, decently creative person who has decent ideas. But it does seem like a lot of times I have a problem uh, executing on them. So, you know, I could use a little more journey mindset are we calling this journey mindset now like (laughs) like gorilla mindset (laughs) oh my gosh that's too funny good reference blast from the past right (laughs) good reference Uh, yeah the journey mindset i i'm in the same boat as you whereas i don't struggle for uh the maybe the the impetus to take take action and start doing things it's just at this point finding the time you know so i've really got to pick and choose which creative outlet or which professional outlet, um, whatever it is that I'm doing, I've really got to be selective because, you know, I get, I get to choose like maybe one, (laughs) one or two. So, uh, well, the funny thing is like, I think one difference between us is that you have an ultimate priority that overrides any other priority. Mm. And so it impels you to take more time in accounting for, your free time that you have to work on your projects. Mm. And that's what I've kind of seen with you is that you make the time because you need to make the time. Mm. If you, all of your time is free, why economize on it at all? Right. Yeah. I have so much more perspective and respect for, for all of those former personal training clients I had a decade ago when that was my, when that was my profession you know, and I would be, I would throw out the dogma of, oh, you just need to make time to exercise. <laughs> now realizing the type of people that I was working with, they needed to make the time and they were making the time and it was very important for them. But outside of that 45 minutes to an hour that they had three days a week, they did not have time. You know, it was, I appreciate that now. Whereas back then I was so, I was, just a personal trainer. I got to work out 90 minutes a day, <laughs> you know, I, you were at work I, and I was at work. Another yeah. un, un, uh, unnegotiable yeah. commitment. Right? And I was at work. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting when we can step into others frame and sort of see like, you know, the way they choose their priorities relative to their responsibilities says a lot. Yeah. Um, really at the end of the day, they are the authority on their own lives. Full stop. One hundred percent. Quick, uh, quick, not necessarily tangent, but story on the appreciating where others are coming from. Um, my wife and I started watching a show. We just 
found on YouTube. I think it's on like Lifetime and they happen to put it up on YouTube. But it's called it's called Fit to Fat to Fit. And the idea came from this personal trainer that years ago he wanted to better understand what his clients were feeling like. So mm. the so the guy went from like a super fit 190, 190 pounds and he gained over the course of a year 75 pounds. And then over the the next year, he lost that that weight, but he documents the journey. He documented his journey. He's got a cool website. Um, but they've now created a TV show about it where you've got one person who is who wants to lose some weight and they pair with a trainer. But that trainer's job for the first four months is to gain roughly 25 to 30 percent of their body weight. So you've got some guys gaining between 45 and 60 pounds in four months, which is just almost unheard. It's and that's incredibly hard to do in and of itself. You need a trainer just to do that. You it, like when when like actors put on weight and stuff like that for roles. Sure, sure. I have tried. I mean, I have tried to gain weight. You know, like in college, in college or college sports or whatever. It, eating that much is hard. In and of its force feeding yourself, and you've got these trainers. Anyway, it's a fantastic show because these trainers have to go from like a lifetime of peak physical condition, and they've got to, you know, they would say throw it all away for four months, and then with their client that they've been paired with, go on that weight loss journey together. And now from the, you know, that the personal trainer now has a completely different perspective on what it means to cut back 40 pounds or 50 pounds, you know, you know what they are. They're, uh, they're jock wanderers. They're jock wanderers. <laughs> <laughs> the meathead wanderer brigade. <laughs> yeah. That's so awesome. It is. Oh my God. It's because they willingly put themselves in the uh, position of being not too fit looking, not looking great, bro. Yeah. And uh, they, and they, and they walk with their brother or sister back to the promised land. They do. It, they do. It, it, That's awesome. It's been cool so far. It's what's, what I find, what I really appreciate is that the comments that they make about uh, overweightness or obesity is, from their perspective, very different uh, before they go on that weight gain journey. And then yeah. they've got to realize and experience what it's like to try to cut back. Um, their whole attitude, their perspective is just, you know, it's a little, it's a little naive, I would say, you know. Do, one of the things I keep thinking about, so I'm just going to ask, do they experience any psychological changes when they gain all that weight that they report on? Psychological, not just physical, emotional yeah, it's um, and what's interesting, we've watched I think two or three episodes now, but each of the trainers, the first couple weeks is actually like pretty good for them. They 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 realize that there's another part of life than just eating super clean, bland food oh, and yeah. working out an hour a day. It's fun to go out to restaurants and try new food and and relax and be social, it, to take the stick out of their ass, so to speak. Yeah, you know, there's there's such an enjoyable part of life, and then. Because you're, these guys are eating between like seven, you know, seven thousand, ten thousand calories per day. It ruins their emotions, <laughs> not just their bodies, but they get sleepy all the time. I mean, it's just yeah. like it's just a complete flip of what they're used to living, and it's a per, it's a personal journey for everyone. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. So, um, well, I just I think we're both fascinated with this idea of people who willingly give up. Like, because these people who are so fit, fitness is really important to them. It's not as if it's just like they live it. You know, that's why they're thing fit. that they are. That's yeah. why they're fit because they live they live that lifestyle each and every hour of the day. It yeah. takes a commitment. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like uh, Rob Lowe on that um, uh, Parks and Rec show where he's like, "My body is a microchip, a single grain of sand." You know, and so he's <laughs> you know he's making these like you know turkey burgers with like a you know. Uh, all these like really elevated and healthy components. Yeah. And then uh, what's his name? The libertarian boss guy just like put some 
beef on the grill on a bun gives to him he's like this is the best thing i've ever had ron he's swanson. never really <laughs> yeah ron swanson and rob rob lowe's like this is the best thing i ever had you know like yeah it's just it's just actual meat it's, you know yeah. like and yeah uh, protein man it's what's often for dinner <laughs> it is <laughs> it is i've got i've got last tangent i've got an uncle who lives in north idaho who actually in his retirement he used to be an er nurse for years and uh, but he's got a uh, a beef farm out in uh, out in north idaho and a ranch he's got a ranch not a beef farm <laughs> but man <laughs> i like that though <laughs> it, there's something about there's something about just grass fed grass raised beef i don't know something about it maybe it's in my head but i love the way that organic beef is you know um yeah yeah, it's funny because I well, it's not funny at all. I I heard a story on these um, concentrated feeding operations they call them, but factory farms they yeah. have these words for them now, and yeah. like how much they're just they ruin everything. They ruin everybody and everything. And uh, so, whether yeah. you agree with like you know raising animals for meat or anything like that, we can all agree that there are better and worse ways to treat our fellow life forms and. So I, I yeah. always like hearing about people who uh, take the time to run, you know, farms on a smaller scale that they can yeah. be ethically, uh, you know, have some integrity about. Totally. Yeah. Some of those factory farming videos are just, they make you never want to eat meat again. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, have, I know that I know several will of one students who have had just that experience, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, Jade in our uh, working group, um, the other sales working group, uh, she does a lot of, uh, activism at slaughterhouses and stuff like that and the things that she reports that her that she and her fellow activists witness i mean i hope one day we can have her on to talk about her experience with the law of one because i know that 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 concept of our duty and our responsibility to second density creatures is a big part of her path and her passion hmm. um yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty tough to hear about and must be even tougher to witness yourself. Yeah. You know, something I wrestle with is my, my love of hunting, mm. you know, because there's one side of me that I just can't stand to kill an animal. I can't stand it. But there's this other side of me that loves eating meat. Yeah. And I feel like if I'm going to eat meat, I should at least be willing to to take the life of the animal that I'm going to eat. Like I'm not, you know, I don't want, I'm not going to outsource that or I may, or I don't know if there's something about it that connects you with the, with the meat that you're eating. If when you like, I earned this, I had to go through the battle of killing this thing and then dressing it and doing all the, doing all the things you got to do. Um, That's why I was going to ask is, do you do all of it? I do all of, I mean, do you, all of it, except I think for the killing part is one of the easier parts. It's the dealing with that, formerly living thing and transforming it into something that you can consume right well that's it's, a process that you go through it's at different levels because the killing of it is actually hard because the target that you are shooting for at sometimes far distances is smaller than a paper plate and oh, yeah, if yeah. you don't you mean like skillfully difficult uh, well i mean if if you're not on target if you're just off by a couple inches if you wound it if yeah. you wound it You've just wounded yourself. I don't yes. know of a single hunter I've ever spoken to that has wounded an animal and not taken that to heart. It's been a terrible experience. And you spend all day, sometimes multiple days, tracking an animal, trying to track the blood and track the animal so that you can put, you can put it down. Now, I'll also have you know, like elk, for example, are ridiculously tough. I've seen elk being shot with an arrow through the gut only to come back a week later, completely fine. You know, I mean, it's, it, wild animals are truly Holy something crap. to behold. However, if you hit it in the, in the knee or you hit it in a joint and then you, it can't walk, I mean, it's just going to become wolf food. You know, if it's just going to become wolf food and that is not a good way to go for, uh, no, for an elk. No. So sorry to be, you know, so, uh, no, I'm just uh, vivid here. Maybe we but, could cut this out, but what, what, what do you, what kind of, what kind of round do you need to use on an elk? Um, 
that is a tough question because okay. there are Don't many. Worry about well, it. there are many that you can use, but um, a relatively I mean, large. If you one, hit them right, any of them work, right? <laughs> I mean, that there's some truth to that. Even I mean, if you hit them with a very small 22 caliber bullet, ah, that it, it will still take them a while to die from blood loss. Even I think even if you hit him in the heart, it still might take him it still might take him like five minutes. You know, I'm I'm kind of guessing. Do people hunt with twenty twos? No, I don't think you're allowed okay. to. All right, you were being you were exaggerating. For yes, like I a, gotcha. yeah. Like if you're if you get in a fight with a bear and you've got a nine millimeter, like eh, it, it, I don't know. <laughs> you better be Just a good bury shot. your head. <laughs> <laughs> you better be a good shot. But yeah. The last time I went hunting out with my out with my brother um, his, his rifle wasn't completely, the rifle scope he was using, just, it needed to be upgrade, upgraded. Yeah. And, uh, we were hunting together, but unfortunately he shot all of the bullets he had and he still could not put the animal down. So oh my God. it was, it was, ter it's terrible. It's a terrible feeling because yeah. it's just a terrible feeling. So, um, so, but terrible feelings sometimes are part of what it means to take responsibility, right? Well, yes. And I've actually heard it in this factory farming that some employees become somewhat desensitized to the yeah. way that these animals are being treated because you just, you're seeing that all day long. So anyway, this is a whole a left field conversation for what we want to get into today. But I, uh, I, I appreciate that experience because it's so complex with, you know, it's so complex of an experience. Yeah. And, and I, I'm serious about, uh, getting, getting somebody like Jade on, um, who can talk from the other side of it. Cause I think she'd probably have a lot of really, uh, um, I think she'd have a lot to say that we would have to reckon with. Sure. Even, even though, you know, we've thought a lot about this, like it's uh, my, my thing is that I, um, you know, <laughs> Sometimes you just have to admit that you're a hypocrite and be like, this is the world that we live yeah. in. Like, no. you know. Yeah. I think I think if a lot of people had to kill their own meat, there would be a lot less wasted food. There'd be yeah. a lot less meat. <laughs> or there'd be a lot more vegans. <laughs> yep. There'd be a lot more vegans. But uh, anyway, down to business. Today, we want to cover and review... A transcript from 2007, a quo transcript where the group members are asking about religion. The group members are asking, hey, there are all these different religions. They all seem to have this center of truth, but each religion has their own group, so to speak, and they all kind of have their own dogma and some can become fanatic. So can you help us? Right. And uh, one of the reasons that I like this one and chose this one uh, to speak about today is because it doesn't just stick with religion narrowly understood. It kind of uh, branches out into where do religions come from? Who are the people who push them? Why do they push them? And what is their relationship to truth, to the uh, valuing of the intellect over the heart? Um, what is it about uh these, these inspirational ideas that really, uh, grab people and how do they get, uh, how do they at once, uh, marshal people's will and, uh, love and, uh, desire to, uh, strive even harder for the upward spiraling light. And yet in our experience, we can see that they often, in fact, most of the time get turned into some of the most dead um, ideas that you can possibly imagine, like some of the most uh, inert and controlling uh, systems uh, that humans experience, like full stop, mic drop, like religion should be up there yeah. with things like totalitarian governments and stuff like that, right? In terms of like what they're able to accomplish in terms of uh, controlling people. Yeah, I'm there with you. And I think this, what you've just brought up is the reason why I essentially turned away from religious exploration when I was younger, just experiencing other people's judgment of other good people 
because those other people didn't fit in with their ideology. And, uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's why I, yeah, for a while turned, turned away, called myself an atheist, uh, cause I couldn't handle, <laughs> I couldn't handle, didn't know how to navigate the dogma. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Um, it's a social, uh, discipline that we learn usually, or a lot of times really young, either that, or you are a convert in as an adult and there's nobody more fanatical than an adult convert. You know, that's, that's what Catholics often say is that it's the adult converts, you know, who didn't grow up with it that are often the most fanatical about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In any case, this, this reading is, uh, February 18th, 2007. And we're, we, there is no way that we're going to cover this reading in one, uh, in one episode where we, uh, read through it like we often do and intersperse our commentary. So I'm going to take excerpts. And we'll put the link to the transcript in the show notes. And I encourage everybody to read this because, you know, as somebody who has, you know, done a little bit of channeling myself and I've seen and I've seen Carla uh, masterfully do this. um, These these channeled messages have a flow all of their own. And a lot of what these words are, even when they get a little bit um, wordy that they're, they're modulating the energy through these words. And so the way that that flows is not simply an artifact of the information coming through. There's also something to the way that they actually structure these concepts, uh, uh, um, um, with the diction they choose with, uh, how, uh, loquacious they can be about describing things, you know, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll use the most roundabout way to describe something, but there's, there's an energy to that, that, Ought, ought not to be uh, completely dismissed. With that said, mm. why don't we jump right in? We'll we'll skip over um, all of their uh, disclaimers about free will. Everybody knows not to take this uh, too seriously. Make sure that you, uh, before you take it seriously, you check with yourself and see how you feel. And you don't uh, just simply adopt things that the Confederation instructs without making sure that it's right for you. Jeremy, could I ask your opinion quickly? about why it is that some of these paragraphs, some of these messages are so verbose. Yeah. I'm wondering, in my mind, I'm wondering if the message that one is feeling and and channeling perhaps is so full uh, that maybe all these words just come out to try to, you know, try to uh, note the fullness of, of the message or... Or is it a slow trickle and you're just wending your way around like an old stream? I mean, what, why does this? It can be, it can be both of those things and other things. My, my general sense is that when you're on the beam, when you're really, really centered and it's coming through real clear, there is no need to be wordier than is needed. And you've certainly, I think both of us have read many, many, many uh, Confederation transcripts where they get right to the point. It's almost terse. Yeah. yeah. Um, my feeling having done a little bit of this and talked to other channels who have done a little bit of this is that when they get wordy, it's either because they're trying to get us to stop analyzing as we're bringing it through. And so th- th- making it a little bit inscrutable to pay attention to is a way to get us the instrument to stop bringing, to stop analyzing it mm. and maybe subtly shifting or, or, or manipulating the message that comes through. I know that happens with me a lot. If I get, um, if I get fatigued or, you know, even more problematic for me, and that's something I work on is when I have, uh, <laughs> when I have an opinion about the message, mm. right, it mm-hmm. becomes a lot harder to set that opinion aside. And in the, uh, last, uh, channeling intensive we did, there was one, that I, there was a quote that I channeled solo and, um, it was on yellow Ray and like organizational politics and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. And, uh, they kept saying, you know, if the instrument would simply take a step aside. Right. And like, (laughs) I used to think that I thought at first that that was them saying, you know, Hey, stop manipulating the message. We got this. You don't need to think about this so much. And to a certain extent they were, but they always said a small step aside. They always said a slight step aside. And I think what they were saying is that you have some stuff for us to work with, but you got to just loosen your grip a little bit. Hmm. And what they did hmm. is they took some of the ideas that I've thought about, but they took them in completely different directions than I would. Hmm. 
and and I think making your mind available to these entities is not simply about letting them say whatever, like what like something pure that they want to say from their vantage point. What they can say from their vantage point is very limited for us because they don't understand what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to communicate in a way that makes a difference in our lives, but they can't possibly put themselves in our shoes fully. So they use the instrument and the instrument's concepts, memories, uh, temperament in a lot of ways. I think Carla's temperament was exercised by Kuo, Hatan, Latwi often. Um, and those, that's raw material that they can use to ground their higher message in our lower experience. So mm. a lot of what is going on when they kind of get wordy and like they, they say the most roundabout things. I mean, in that solo one that I did, there was like, the disclaimer was like two paragraphs long and they're like, this is what we, we, when we come from the place where we do, we always ask blah, blah, blah. It's like, dude. And I think that that is worthy of criticism mm -hmm. because it shows that I wasn't on the beam oh, and oh. that I was uh, maybe a little bit distracted. It happens. Um, and uh, the, the part of the discipline in channeling is being able to get back on the beam, right? To like sure. say, oh, I can see that my trumpet is uh, getting a little bit out of tune because of atmospheric conditions. And I just need to like adjust the valve here so that we can get things back in tune and play a nice B flat, you know? Sure. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. It's, um, Interesting. and this is why um, I think it's important uh, that we do this podcast where we look at these readings. And so we can give people an idea of how to approach this stuff, how to digest it, how to get the information out without getting hung up in the uh, details of the diction and wording. And, you know, you don't have to like Quo as a, uh, a poet, you don't. Sure. But um, if you can get something useful out of it, then it doesn't matter how they say it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they, they largely start out in this reading. Uh, they talk about vibration and the nature of reality, uh, how there, there seems to be solid matter, but we really know that most solid matter is like almost entirely like empty space and just talking about energy and how energy, uh, fields cooperate it seems like they're like kind of going off in a direction that uh, doesn't have anything to do with religion at all. It has to do with science. And yet what they're bringing it back to is that love created all of these conditions in which energy uh, coagulates, vibrates one off another um, um, and imbues the reality that we perceive with this element that we are constantly looking for this create the, the creator's love. I do. And this is part of our life. It, yeah, I if I can elaborate, I really like just a couple points in these first, you know, call it four, first three or four paragraphs. I love that Quo starts it off saying, hey, let's not talk about religion per se. Let's talk about your scientists. <laughs> and you guys, you used to think that the universe was mostly empty, but now your scientists are telling you, no, it's actually full, full of energy full of matter, dark matter, whatever, I mean, whatever it is, they don't say dark matter, but it's actually full. And this is coming from your scientists. And I love that Quo throws in there, quote, this is not given to you by your priests or prophets, but by your scientists who have become the priests and prophets of your culture. I appreciated that because it, it seems like scientists these days have become for so many the the priest the prophet of the purveyor of truth and all that is you know so i just like that that being pointed out here oh this is one of my favorite topics in the world um fundamentalist materialism and the scientific community and how it has transformed from i mean i don't mean to put too fine of a point on it there's still a lot of peer review there's still fantastic work being done <clears throat> But because it's all done, nobody's doing what like uh, Isaac Newton did, where they're all supporting their own work. They're all almost like these scientific entrepreneurs who are free to think exactly as they think. And they correspond with, you know, other free thinkers 
all over the world to try to think of, okay, let's get some inspiration on like cogent models we can apply to our experimental data that help us see the underlying mechanisms of things and reason about it better, right? I mean, all a law of the universe is or a law of physics or any kind of uh, uh, thing that we say, this is the way the world works, right? Gravity works this way and we can describe it and we can predict it. That's just a simplification of what otherwise would be um, like a different experience that we perceive every time. We are making Mm. Uh, rules that help us predict what that experience we're going to have is going to be. Mm. But ultimately, they're rules that um, simplify and leave out a lot of stuff. And that's good because we need to have simplified ways of understanding our world so we can reason about it in just the ways that we care about. Because there's so many ways, because we have to focus, right? Consciousness is about focus. And you have to focus on one thing at a time in order to make stuff happen in this world. Yeah. But I do like um, that Kuo mentions that, hey, you live in an advanced society where science is done by institutions, not by single integri- people of integrity. Um, not to say that science aren't, scientists aren't people of integrity. They absolutely uh, often are. But it's the institutions that fund all of this, that have a vested interest in the outcome, that have a vested interest in um, the applications, right? So it's so much military mm-hmm. funding mm-hmm. goes into a lot of science, so much pharmaceutical funding goes into science. And those have particular worldviews about what good products of science would be. Mm-hmm. And it changes science from the pure pursuit of truth for its own sake into a tool that's used for technology. And I think it's hard sometimes for people to recognize that technology is a kind of control that we exercise over reality in ourselves. Hmm. Um, It's almost political in a way, in the sense that the way that we organize ourselves, such as in churches or institutions or governments, is a kind of technology in the way that the ability to organize uh, slaves building the pyramids was a kind of technology that human, humanity developed in order to focus will of several people to a collective end. Yeah. And our uh, scientific progress in honing technology and being able to take human agency out of that and more and more introduce um, a mechanistic approach to, poli- to this politics, this quasi-politics that I'm talking about called technology. Um, I think we're at a point right now where a lot of the way that our world works is automated and it's getting more automated all the time and less and less are any humans involved. Mm -hmm. And so what we are dealing with, with science is a, is a philosophy in a lot of ways of a mechanistic universe that only needs to be put in the right order in order to do everything that we want and give us everything we want. And yet what do we keep finding? We keep finding that it serves the powerful and the rich a lot more than us. And more and more, it's not even serving them. They're, uh, they're subordinate to the algorithm as well. The algorithm of profit over all other concerns. Hmm. Oh man, I'm really going off the rails here. (laughs) Well, let's, let's bring it back because with that, with that, I'm going to take what you just said with a certain attach a tone to it or attach a, a feeling to it. Attach anything I'm gonna, to it, please. I'm just going to attach it. <laughs> and I'm going to reference this other couple sentences that Quo brings up. Quote, The energy that created the stars is that of love. The energy that created you is the energy of love. That does not define love, for love is all that there is. There is nothing to which to compare it. There's nothing from which to to contrast it. That little section I also love. It just reiterates in another way that all, everything in the universe has love, is created from love. Now, it might be a love that we don't quite understand or can't access. It's something on a completely different level, but everything that exists is a manifestation of that one incredibly power energy that is all. So even the profit motive, even our, even our institutional driven scientific, you know, research, it's still all a part of that mess that we experience in this infinite yeah. one universe that is only created of love. Yeah. It's taking the pejorative aside. It is a focus of consciousness, a focus of awareness mm-hmm. that issue that, that, that produces a certain 
reality, a certain outcome. Mm -hmm. And the only problem is when we fail to recognize our role in creating that focus and therefore creating that reality. Yes, because right? we manifest, we are, our, we are creators as well, which I love to continue to think about that whatever's yeah. going on in my day, well, I could be creating some of that <laughs> or what, you know, it's yeah. whatever I want in 20 years, I can create that. Might take some yeah. work and a certain attitude, but, and that the same is true for everyone else, you know? Absolutely. Um, and I think the reason that they start off talking about scientific things and uh, the energetic nature of everything and how that's connected to love is they're trying to sketch out um, what Carla used to call often uh, the democracy of the spirit or the spiritual democracy. The mm. idea that we are all equally uh, able to access love in the moment, love as the binding force of our entire reality and our entire experience, no matter how material and no matter how ineffable and spiritual within, mm -hmm. it is all connected by this thread of love. And so all of our experiences, all of our insights, um, all of our uh, suffering and joy is really one experience, suffering, joy. It's all part of one thing that, Nobody has really a better say over than anybody else. Hmm. And where they go with this is they start getting into the issue of the authority figure. And this is where they start to bring religion in. I think it might be good to just uh, read that, um, that excerpt uh, so that we can just kick it off this way. Um, so let's say this, they're talking about energy, they're talking about love and how everything is bound up in this, uh, process and, uh, experience. So cool. You experience life as you breathe in and breathe out. And you ask what this experience is for you are aware of yourself. And certainly you have many, many voices in your ear, happy to explain precisely what life is and how to live that life in a good way. Please understand as you look back over some of your more difficult experiences with authority figures who have attempted to tell you what to believe, that every entity who seeks to serve the infinite creator can fall into what the one known as T called the trap of teaching in such a way as to constrict the energies of those listening to his words. That is uh, exactly what I try to avoid in my life. I recognize what they mean on a fun, on a visceral level in my gut. I know what it means to talk about anything, even the law of one, in a way that tries to close the book on it, right? And try to say, no, my idea about it is the way. I'm sure you've had that experience too, Ryan. Yes, but yes. <laughs> and I think that is... My English today is just terrible. I can't find the words ah, I'm looking about for, it. but it is exemplified in each of us as each of us has our own way that we relate to the world and to ideas. And you know what? The way that we say relate to the law of one or any religion, any religion, any spiritual belief system, it is a book. You just, you never get to yeah. the last page. And I think people, I think you can misunderstand or misconceive, misperceive that, oh yeah, I've got this book of ideas in front of me and you read and you read. And these, these ideas are just your own experiences and your own understandings. Mm -hmm. But you look at this book, not realizing that behind the last page is yet one more fucking page <laughs> and you just, to be continued, you, right? to be, you will never, ever get to the end because you know what? You can go back and reread a chapter and then you're going to like any other book that you read, if you reread it, you get new things out of it and it's yes. a never ending journey. And this goes back to one of the first, one of the first sessions of in raw and the raw contact where they say that the, in, the universe is infinite. It truly is infinite because are we ourselves not infinite? Are, is there truly an end to ourselves? No, there is not. There is not an end to ourselves. You know, there's always something new to learn, something new to do, something new to explore, something deeper to get into. We are infinite. That book never ends. 
but yep. it is still our book and it can often feel different than that other person's book and what they're reading and what they're doing. It does, you know, it does feel different. That's what mirroring I think is a lot of about. It's about, Hey, we know that as third density conscious, um, entities, you're going to have a focus that is about your lessons and your things you're working on. So we're going to give you other people who have other foci, foci who can reflect back to you those things that maybe you're not fully paying attention to, but are just as much part of the creator as you are. And, and look like this, this, this is um, what they're talking about here from my point of view is uh, they are distinguishing this constricting way of talking about quote unquote truth from this expansive way that one way tries to uh, tell you how it is and make sure that that's the way that you approach reality. The other way offers you a gift of a new idea as an inspiration and mm. says, I want to see what you do with this. If anything, right? It's yours to drop on the floor. It's yours to take and run with and find an even better way to express it or a better way to, to realize it in your life. This expansive way that sees human intellectual and spiritual development as not a single, it's not a hierarchical thing where one person is directing it from above, but a network of all of us bringing our parts of the creator to bear on this mystery, right? Like even my ideas of institutional science that I was beating the drum about, that's me in a way constricting things. And trying to say, well, I want to talk about this. And, you know, that, that's not really what we're talking about, Jeremy. Like, that's, you're going off on a tangent and you're trying to, uh, you know, distract the, the conversation. So it can happen to all of us. I mean, I have my biases. I have my opinions. Ryan, you have made your opinions and biases known by the very fact that you open your mouth, right? Like, yes. we all do this. Yes. Yes. I, but, I, like Quo states, the trouble is when you've got a teacher in someone who other people are looking to for help and for info and the lessons that teacher is giving and offering somewhat constricts the ideas of others. Yeah. I think and it can come from a good place, it right? It can, but I think right off the bat, just taking that at surface level, that to me is a great flagging mechanism. When you're listening to the message of anyone, whether it be, well, anyone is that message constricting in some way you know does and, it, and it doesn't mean that you reject the person saying the constricting thing it just means not. that you're aware of the energy of the moment yes yes i, I so don't that know you don't ever you don't ever surrender your agency to decide for yourself what you believe yeah because that is the way that the creator is able to work through you in a way that you can benefit from the lessons that that issue from that that belief right yeah that catalyst. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, uh, to read a little bit more about the authority figure. Mm -hmm. um, here's uh, more Kuo. An entity who is moved and inspired by whatever agency, personality, or inspired writing becomes aware of himself in a special way. Sorry. An entity becomes aware of himself in a special way uh, when they are moved or inspired by whatever agency, personality, or inspired writing they encounter. It is a little weird I, way I read it. Sorry. He becomes aware of how alive he is, and he thinks, I must give this gift, this wonderful life I feel, to others. I must pass on this wonderful inspiration that is given to me. There is generally no intention of doing anything other than the purest good. However, the trap of dogma is always waiting for the teacher. It is a wise teacher indeed who is able to differentiate between his personal experiences with the divine and that which is helpfully expressed concerning seeking the divine in a world that wishes to codify organize and arrange life in an orderly manner the mystical view which is found at the heart of all religions and many philosophies as well while greatly appealing is found cumbersome and awkward to teach when you're speaking of something that is indescribable and ineffable words fail and the human tendency then is to apply an organization to the mystery of the one creator and different religions have had different reasons to create different structures of belief, which have hardened into dogma. Ain't that the truth? Amen. Amen. I'm not sure I have much to add on that. If you, no. if you just take the time to digest that, 
that one's pretty clear. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of those terse passages, I feel like. They get right to the point. They don't use any extra words, I feel. Yeah. Yeah, I feel you. So, so we have this idea that there is this aspect of human striving, human society, how we relate to each other on the spiritual uh, wavelength that involves uh, control. Let's just be blunt about it. Control, the constricting way of expressing truth that we all recognize inside of ourselves. But then um, when it is uh, sort of channeled through this organized way of dealing with the mystery that we all have, you know, a kind of a democratic grasp of, it starts to become a way that we can only express that inner truth through this rubric, right? We can only express this inner truth in the context of this religion. And then the religion becomes a way to kind of like control that. I like, um, I do believe it's, this is the next, this is in the next paragraph. Um, but if control, if, if the organization, if, yeah, if the organization is about helping to control and that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, you're just trying to put some guardrails around whatever's going on that can be restricting. And as Quo states next, if the creator is infinite love and infinite light, and if the creation is evolving continuously forever, then there is continuously more of truth than there was before. Consciousness is continuously expanding. The problem with any dogma, then, is that it cannot reform itself to hold the new truth that is flowing forth at every moment from the creative principle. Bingo. So, that is another fantastic uh, terse, as you put it, paragraph, straightforward. You, we get these guardrails up by, yeah, these are complex issues. And you know what? Wherever we're at today, we could we could build a fence around wherever we're at today. But you know what? Tomorrow, we might not be in the same place. So how are we going to break through those fences that we've just built for ourselves? Well, dogma can very easily become those spiritual, emotional, psychological fences that, that f- make us feel safe can keep us in one spot, can keep the wolves out, can keep us all together in one spot. But boy, it can become constricting in what Quo says in an, in a ever, you know, in a a continuously evolving creation. Yeah. I think that is such a genius way to think about it because it is reminding us that that last page of that book is not the last page. It's just, we divided reality up into volumes. Yes. Right. And like those volumes serve our interests, either our personal interests or some other interest that uh, uh, wants reality organized this way so that maybe they're in charge or maybe they think that's the way to serve. I, I am I'm a big believer. And I think I've said this on the podcast before that uh, creativity uh, uh, flourishes and constraints. Right. Like yes. our ability to focus our consciousness often benefits from the constraints and the boundaries of thought systems, be they philosophies, be they religions, um, be they disciplines of uh, the intellect or whatever. Like they are ways of tightening that flashlight beam of awareness so that we can see more and see more clearly something that otherwise we might pass over, something that will uh, enrich our lives, right? The problem is, is what happens when we believe that there's one flashlight beam focus point that's more important than others? We focus on that flashlight beam. And we think everybody else should too. No, oh, that's even better. A lot of the that's time, even right? Better, taking it to the next level. Yeah. 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 So like that's what the authority does. And they, they describe it in very sympathetic terms. They want to share what their experience is. But, um, and I think Stephen Timon said this in the, uh, in a fool's phenomenology, that book that I really love, he says, you know, there's this, um, there's this passage where he's talking about ambition and he says, you know, ambition can be the, uh, the impulse. I'm going to butcher it here, but the impulse to apply one's personal significator, uh, the template of one's personal significator to everybody else's experience, right? Like, because I think that this is meaningful and ineffable and such a pure distillation of things that therefore I have to make you see it the way that I see it. 
And remember, <laughs> we don't have utility to the creator if we all see the same thing. That's not why there's diversity in that unity of the creation. There's so many things running through my head, but and I, and I could easily take it off in tangents, but I'll just leave it at this. Just a reminder that we don't see the world the way that it is. We see it the way that we are. And... Uh, Yep. Don't do that. <laughs> or at least <laughs> Well, I mean, you're going aren't you going to do it in, in, inevitably you as long as you're you in manifestation help. and you're constrained you and in a, in a limited being. And good yeah. for you. And good for you for becoming more of who you are. You know, yeah. but failing to recognize the agency and the power in everyone else to do the same thing for themselves. Trouble that's a trouble. That's a hashtag. Not trouble. only that, the magic of the constraints is not simply in how they constrain, but in breaking through them. Breaking through the constraints is also a way to use them because then you have kind of like a marker, right? This is, you have a marker of when you went into a different awareness. This is why when great music comes out that sounds new and fresh and amazing, why it can be such a big deal. I mean, if you think of music, I think the uh, they tried atonal music a while ago that they forced me to learn about in music school. That was not, a, in my opinion, a good evolution. You looks like you have a great comment about atonal music. <laughs> I think it is a good evolution. Oh, I, Counterpoint. I, oh. Arnold Schoenberg is one of my favorite composers. You psycho. No. No. <laughs> Friends, don't listen to Schoenberg. Do his, not. His piano works uh, like really <laughs> affected my music. I'm not kidding you. Okay, okay, we can have an argument about modern, about modern music and modern art, but it's the contrast with with harmony that is so interesting. And like you know, the the, the problem is is that um, from a point of view of uh, enjoying it, and we can take this as kind of like a, a commentary on the idea of overcoming constraints in general. Mm. The constraints of harmony serve a purpose, but going against them serves almost just as much of a purpose, right? Like yeah. it's kind of like with jazz improvisation, right? You learn the scales, you learn the modes, you learn what the right notes are to play at any given moment in the song so that you can play the wrong note in the right yeah. way, right? Sure. Because then it's meaningful. It means something that you're exceeding uh, the template and you're going outside and now you've done something creative and unique. But if all you do is just play random notes... Most people are not going to recognize that as artistic. It's not going to have um, the uh, the charge of the creative spirit if you're just blah, 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 blah. unless you're Sun Ra. In that case, like you are um, channeling anyway through uh, jazz music, and and you're the man. The point, sorry, the point I was getting at, which you've just you've just you know. You just got, I was also, I was also Googling while I was, while I was listening to you. So was, that's how I got away. I with was it. failing at multitasking, but my, <laughs> I apologize. My original point, good, I just wanted to get my facts straight. I don't even know if I have my facts straight still, but um, the original, my original point was that it, we listen to pop music and it follows the same set of rules. We have a harmony. You've typically got nowadays the same chord progression. Um, it's kind of a big deal when an artist comes out and they follow the rules, the constraints, but they make a, they make a choice to break one of the rules or to try something new. And if they do it yeah. well and they break through, it's, it's a big, it's a big deal. Now I thought this was attributed to Beethoven, but I'm looking at Wikipedia. God forbid, I believe anything on Wikipedia, but I'm going to try it. But I do remember learning in, in music appreciation class about something called the surprise symphony. And it was a surprise because literally written into the symphony is what sounds like a wrong note. It's like a trombonist comes in one beat early. So you have this orchestra playing, there's this big hold, la, and then it pauses. And then the whole orchestra is supposed to come in at this big hit and keep going. Well, a trombonist comes in one count early <laughs> and it sounds like it's an error. So you're in the crowd and you're listening to this you're like, dude, that guy's going to get fired. Like he just messed up. But no, it's actually written in there that it's it's written as a wrong note. Maybe it's like a joke, but it, it kind of broke the rules at the time. And the symphony, it says symphony number 94 by Haydn. I'm really going to have to check this because I could have swore this was Beethoven, but maybe it's Haydn. Um, but um, 
but it broke the rules. It took the constraints of everyone always playing together, and the composer made a snarky little joke and put in a, an early hit from a different instrument and kind of broke the rules, and uh, it was a hit. That's fascinating. I love that. I, lo I love those stories. Um, <laughs> I feel like with pop music, I mean, you can you can sound out there and new and fresh because things are so <laughs> codified and uh, productized now that mm. just putting a key change in, just modulating, just modulating. Up a, a step yeah. can make you sound like as fresh as stuff from the 80s and 70s sounded. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love if... I'm going to put a link to this guy's channel. Rick Beato has a oh, great yes. music YouTube channel, and he'll do this series called What Makes This Song Great? And it's a great series because he's super knowledgeable about music. I mean, the guy's got a graduate degree from, I think it's from Juilliard in like bass performance. or I mean, he's legit, but he became a, a producer for country and pop and rock. Anyway, amazing channel, but he talks about what makes songs great. And uh, he talks about Sting and just why Sting was amazing, an amazing musician. And for a pop musician like Sting to do what he did, which was, com it was just completely other than what every other pop musician was doing and is still doing. Um, it gives you an appreciation for people that, that kind of break the mold, you know, yeah, the idea that the mold kind of, that breaking the mold is a way of using it just as much as conforming to the mold. Yeah. So anyway, this is why um, an ever-changing universe is constantly going to be breaking the mold, right? A universe that is uh, evolving the way that we believe in this Confederation philosophy, it does, evolving towards, you know, a talos of... Uh, you know, unity back with the creator and going through all sorts of drama in the meantime, through countless eons, uh, where time doesn't even really, uh, time's not really even something we can reason about or even consider. Um, but because everything is changing in smaller and bigger ways, we should expect that, um, our understanding of the truth will, uh, mo will be modified along with it. And, you know, I think that's why, uh, confederation entities often say, you know, in their disclaimer at the beginning of their sessions. We, we can't possibly coordinate the truth for all of you mm. that will read this over, you know, the next however many years people will be reading these transcripts. Please use your own discretion. There are truths that are your truths, and there are truths that are other truths, and they don't have anything to do with the truths themselves. They have to do with where you are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I read the next next few paragraphs here? keep pushing along the quote, Oh, absolutely. Quote, yeah. Please. Quote continues, you know, I just, uh, read quickly and I'll read the last sentence. The problem with dogma then is that it cannot reform itself to hold the new truth that is flowing forth at every moment from the creative principle. Quote continues as the seasons change, as the grass blooms and withers again and again, so the consciousness of humankind evolves, or yes, evolves and grows. You are a point of that consciousness. You have access in your very nature, in every cell of your body, in every thought that you think to the one infinite creator in its undistorted form. Yet that truth lies deeply protected in you. It is protected from your casual thoughts. It is protected from the stormy seas of your daily conscious experience. It is protected by its placement within the heart. The mind and all of its intellectual forces cannot storm the bastion of the open heart. Entities, then, seeking to share bits of their truth with others, become invested in this codified, formalized, organized structure of thoughts that add up to a way to seek the one infinite creator. With a gift of hindsight, scholars have often pontificated as to where a certain religion went wrong or how a certain religion has everything right. Yet, as soon as the seeking for the one infinite creator becomes codified and organized beyond a certain point, 
it can be a delimiting influence rather than an expansive influence. Go off quote. That's exactly right. I kind of feel bad that I, t I went right onto that third paragraph without stopping at the end of the second one where Kuo is stating that this truth of love, of evolution, is deeply protected within us. It's protected from our thoughts. It's protected from our daily experience. It's protected by its placement in our hearts. Yet, in the next, in the next paragraph, I I'm sorry, you have a thought on, on that truth being inside of us all and protected yeah, for that and matter. It's also, it's also protected from religious authorities who would abuse it. That's the upshot, yes. right? Is that to the same extent that we are ignorant of some of the truths that are within us, so are those authorities who seek to uh, organize the mystery. And so there's a certain extent to which they can never violate your, your innermost uh, feelings of deity and connection to deity and uh, 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 the, the sacral nature of being in a, an entity with awareness whatsoever. So that's the upshot is that um, what, what the Confederation has been trying to do for you know the last 60 years is to give us an alternative to going through these constrained, uh, focused, uh, uh, idiosyncratic, uh, ways of approaching the divine through other people, through the religious priests and pastors and other people who seek to mediate truth to our own truth to us. Right. Yeah. There's another option. This is, if I'm going to be candid, my, uh, I don't want to say issue with the law of one community, but I just had this thought that wouldn't it be cool if there was a place where a bunch of people who love this philosophy could get together and talk and explore and experience how how long would it be before it would become something like a church with its own dogma because how many times for example and i don't want to crap on L, uh, the bring forth forum but there are certainly there's personalities on there that the way that they write they're stuck in this dogmatic this place, you know, the, the fences are built around what the law of one is, and there's no room for personal experience, at least the way that I interpret what they're writing. There's no room oh, for yeah. personal experience. There's no room for personal truth and growth. And, and there's, uh, ironically, there's no understanding of others and their points of view. And, but that's something that I thought, wouldn't it be cool to hang out with other people, you know? Um, who enjoy this philosophy, but how long, given what I see, you know, uh, written on the forum sometimes, how long until that kind of attitude about I'm right, this, this is my thoughts and my thoughts are correct. How long until that would be established in a, in a more, not more formal, but in a, a per interpersonal community where you're person to person sitting next to one another. Yeah, where people would leverage power to yeah. exercise that ability to say it's this and not totally. that, right? Totally. And like, I have often felt this way. I, I wrote a blog post on Bring Forth uh, 10 years at least ago where I said, hey, look, <laughs> the raw material is just one entity's uh, a confession of what they think the law of one is. The real law of one is not in a book. It's not in a session of words. It's within you. And the words, the channeled messages, uh, any of the ideas that others talk about with respect to their experience with the law of one fail or succeed based solely on whether they help you get to that inner place. The, the one of the, and this is a big reason why we are doing the other selves working group is because we want to make space for that personal exploration where people can share their ideas as equals. And there is no authority whatsoever, no authority, no center, no central thing. As long as you are studying the material and you're looking inside for its true expression, you are welcome. And we want to work with you. Yeah. It's, it's challenging to be an open and accepting mirror of others, you know, it takes a certain amount of maturity, you yeah, know, certainly. it's important for us to recognize. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you're like me 
And like everybody, you go through a dogmatic phase with anything that you learn new, oh, yeah. right? Because you need that constraint. You're still trying to digest it and figure out, okay, how do I use this to open the key to my heart in those hidden truths? That's personal work though. And it can be so lonely when you don't have a community that you can strive to make the entire community that you find or the, all the other people that you find conform to your particular way that you found things work. If for no other reason to give you the comfort that you're right, because you're terrified that you have it wrong. Yeah. Well, my friends, uh, <laughs> I got some news for you. Yeah. I've got it wrong. Ryan's got it. Wrong, oh, yeah. Got it wrong. Carla's got it wrong. Jim's got it wrong. Austin's got it wrong. Gary's got, we all have something wrong about it. We all are needed to find this. And there's a maturity that comes when you recognize that you don't have all the puzzle pieces and third density is not about intellectually collecting all of the puzzle pieces to have, to see the full picture. It's about, uh, opening your heart so that you don't need to have all the puzzle pieces and you can let love fill in those blanks. But Jeremy, just like our book that we were talking about, it's an infinite puzzle. There's no mm -hmm. way to have all the puzzle pieces because as soon as you put together one portion of that puzzle, you've grown as a person and you have access to a new border. You have access to a new set of puzzle pieces that you can fit in. So it never stops. So while I may, well, personally, I feel right about so many things today that in five years, I'm not going to feel the same about one oh, yeah. in my, in my job in finance and economics was competitive advantage of nations. In other words, if we can manufacture items in China more cheaply, we should do that. We should, you know, we should manufacture in China. We should keep more high value things here in the States. You know, I used to believe that a few years ago. Now I'm not so sure. I'm understanding that there's more nuance required with that particular idea. And it's just, that's, that's everything. <laughs> Everything that I feel right about, that I feel I understand, there's always one more level of nuance and understanding that I can get get to. And when I get to it, there's yet one more level of nuance and understanding. And when I get to that, ad infinitum, it just goes on forever. And that's absolutely true. And I would never uh, uh, speak against that. I do want to uh, widen the beam of the focus, but keep it focused because... We are moving from third density, which is the density of the individual and the yellow ray association of individuals towards collective ends where it's difficult to see the collective interest concretely. Yeah. And so we go through a lot of discipline of people politically and uh, economically in other ways in order to create these collective ends that tend to serve some people over others. We are moving to fourth density where the individual is no longer going to be the constraint on how we think about our interests, how we think about our personal interests, how we think about our collective interests are going to more and more be the same thing in fourth density because we are building social memory. And so while even as a social memory complex, when that uh, process has reached fruition, we will still not have all the puzzle pieces, but the walls between us will largely be down. And so we will deal <laughs> with the uh, problems of not having all the puzzle pieces together. It won't mm. be people uh, lonely and uh, laying awake in the night trying to figure out how this all makes sense and how their suffering fits in. No, we are moving to a world where we will all know each other. If not intimately, uh, there will be no mystery to what's in our hearts. Yeah. There will be no possibility to deceive each other because that's not how fourth density energy works. And so we are going to get to a point where uh, we at least we will be solving the we will be plumbing the mystery together and not solo, mm. and that's what I believe. Law of One seekers, Law of One students, in my opinion, ought to be uh, thinking about how can I contribute not just to my own understanding of the Law of One, but how can I start to build um, ways of relating to my fellow seekers uh, that start to prefigure this coming fourth density reality mm. and sort of like, uh, or the beachhead for the confederation helping us get to this next level. Because look, look at the problems of the world. We are not going to solve this through one great leader figuring it out. It's just, we're way past that point. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, Quo continues about uh, about this this discussion of religion. After saying that, uh, Quo said, yet as soon as the seeking for the one infinite creator becomes codified and organized beyond a certain point, it can be a delimiting influence rather than an expansive influence. And Quo continues, many churches and many different religions decide to bypass the intellect and rest upon the opening of the heart. They engage in song after song that praises the one infinite creator within the language and clothing of that particular religion. Their members are perhaps encouraged to pray out loud and to become ecstatic. And in the surging of the rhythmic cadences of the songs, in the prayers and the praise, the love and light of the one infinite creator seem palpable. And therefore the experience of those seeking the creator in these ways has a certain amount of purity to it, which is missing from those more intellectually organized religions where the mind is the tool used to probe at the meaning of life, of what it is to be a human being, and what it is to serve the one infinite creator. Interestingly enough, love is the one great force that all entities know intimately, but which resists definition completely. And indeed, to attempt to use words to describe love is to attempt to build a great edifice out of pebbles. This little section is interesting because at the same time, I think it feels like Quo is stating that the religious experience is powerful. It's meaningful. We get, we get access to that feeling of love and that open heart. Forget the dogma, forget the, you know, forget the words around it. The experience of it is real and powerful. And that I, that I can appreciate. I also, I also see something here that kind of confirms some of my thoughts about what role the mind plays in the mind, body, spirit complex, that total experience of entityhood of consciousness, mm -hmm. that the mind is largely a constraining force, at least as we experience it consciously. It builds structures, it focuses, it sort of shunts energy that, that would otherwise be undifferentiated emotion and spirit into places where we can actually manifest um, things in the world. It is our ability to think that allows for that to happen in a rational and reasonable way that uh, serves a longer term interest, right? And that people who approach it more from the heart um, are able to route around maybe some of these constraints that the intellectual approach affords. What they lose is the ability to focus it over a long period of time. A lot, uh, often, I think, is that um, it's very much in the moment and it has the constraints of the moment, but also the freedom of the moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, those who uh, approach uh, the divine in a more intellectual sense um, are working more with playing with constraints and using them uh, without appreciating the totality of things that emotion kind of conveys to the to, to somebody. Emotion conveys all of this deep information that can't possibly be accounted for uh, in a dogma or a theory, because these dogmas are, are intellectual constructs. They are not heart constructs. That's a great point, that dogma is the intellectual, one of the intellectual sides of trying to experience or trying to wrap your head around this, you know? And, and, and yeah, even Quo, even Quo says that there there's usefulness to it. In fact, I might jump ahead mm, please. and read something that addresses right here uh, what we're talking about. You are consciousness. It is not something you possess. It is not a characteristic of you. Consciousness lives your life to the extent you can get the details of your personality out of the way. And yet the details of your personality are all valuable. Therefore, the perfectly natural desire of the intensely devoted student to cast aside the personality and devote the self entirely to the silence is, for most entities, a solution that shall not be satisfying. For most entities, each coloration and quirk of the personality is there for a reason. Each seeming challenge, difficulty, and sorrow that occurs in the life has been placed there, not to make you stumble, but to help you learn. 
entities who give themselves over to a religion and accept its dogma simplify their path in a certain way. And if they are able to dwell within that simplified structure of thought without falling into the falling into the trap of judgment mm. of the self and other selves when they do not believe as you do, they are very likely to be able to use that religion as a way to the infinite creator that works well. For each religion teaches the basic love of other people and the love of the one infinite creator. And if an entity loves the creator and loves the neighbor as the self, however that is put, the path to graduation from third density is clear. The choices to serve others has been made. The work is good. Love that. I see. Yeah, I love it too, because I know very well a person who this describes, and it's Carla L. Ruckert. Um, She was a passionate Episcopalian and went to church every Sunday as far. And I think she might even go to church even more often than weekly. She participated in the choir. She uh, loved the liturgy and she understood that what was going on with religion was a kind of structure that helped her find mystery within herself by participating in it. However, (laughs) she uh, did not hold other people to that. She did not, uh, most of the, in fact, there is a lot of evidence in the transcript library that people often got uh, annoyed by the Christianity of Carla Ruckert. Even Hatan Latwi, especially Latwi, Latwi ribs her quite a bit about this <laughs> in some of the, and, yeah. you know, why do we always have to like be challenged in the name of Christ, right? Like what's so special about Christ? Why don't you do Buddha sometimes? Why don't you do Joe Blow at the, gra- at the gas station sometimes? You know? Yeah, I do remember reading that. <laughs> but she was able to use this constraint not to uh, hem herself in or stop her exploration of the mystical that uh, so uh, uh, perfectly evades the ability to codify, construct, um, that that mystery can't be put in a bottle. And yet the bottle can be used in a moment in time, in a moment of consciousness Uh, to work with something that then helps you understand the mystery more. And if you can approach religion that way, I think, I think you're on solid ground, Ryan, it must be in some case, the way that you and your family approach your church, isn't it? Well, we don't go to church (laughs) despite, I I, I want to honestly cut this. (laughs) I want to. Um, I, w- oh, that's right. You were talking about wanting to do it. Yes. And I think, but didn't you used to go to church and a lot of the people you work with, you met through the church? The, the story is that there's a core group of clients that my practice works with that comes from one church and the personality and the approach to life of each and every one of these individuals is like a shining light and there is no judgment from them. There may be dogma, but if there is, they don't express it. There's no judgment like, like Quo stated. As Quo stated, entities who give themselves over to a religion and accepts its dogma simplify their path in a certain way. And if they are able to dwell within that simplified structure of thought without falling into the trap of judgment of the self and other selves, when they do not believe as you do, so on and so forth, then you're doing a great job is what quote says. And that's what, that's what all of these people are. They have not fallen into the trap of judging others and judging themselves. They just have a flow about them and a trust, a trust in God, honestly, is what it is. And seeing that is just inspiring. I understand. I I've seen people like that too, who like I had a friend who he moved away, but his wife was a, uh, Presbyterian pastor, and they had like uh, contemplative uh, services, which were basically just everybody meditating for an no hour way. in the church, yeah. and then you know ha- sharing some fellowship afterwards. I mean, how is that different than what LL Research or I in Richmond yeah. run with my meditation circle? That's exactly, that's almost exactly what we. Well, do. how many? There's a reason why Christianity. Uh, forgive me, I don't know my stats, but I thought that Christianity is diminishing. I think Catholicism is actually growing, but Christianity as a whole, I think, I, I thought I remember reading that people are falling out of 
Christianity. Whether or not that's true, I guess it doesn't matter. I can only speak anecdotally that I know so many people that have left the church that have had experiences in their life and they're like, yeah, I'm out. And why? Why is that? Again, from my experience, each person that I've talked to that has left, they have left because of the dogma, of the judgment that is required, the judgment of oneself if you have sex out of marriage or God forbid you drink a beer or two, you know, depending on how heavy of the uh, the church that you're going to. Um, it's yeah. always about the judgment of your, the judgment that's put on yourself. I haven't met many people that have left because of the judgment that is placed on others. <laughs> Funny enough. However, I can, I can. That part's okay. <laughs> well, okay. Do you have a friend? Does anyone listeners, do you have a friend that when they're with you, they talk crap about someone else? talk crap about that other person, you know, I think we all have friends or fam family like that. Well, how do you know they're not talking crap about you to someone else? It, Ooh, now I'm hopping mad. That's, that's what it, that's what it reminds me of. Like, okay. The church is like, okay, the, the church judges everyone, you know, you know that the church is judging everyone else. And you're judging everyone else. But the moment you realize that you yourself are being judged and you don't, you don't feel like you're a bad person, yet you're being judged as a bad person, it's like, all right, I'm signing off. Thanks. Anyway, I think, I think um, it would be nice. I think it would be nice if uh, there would be just a lot less judgment and a lot more love and understanding. But one can wish. Absolutely. And it, it probably bears noticing that, you know, Christianity in America itself didn't always have all of this political cachet. Mm. It wasn't involved so much in like the politics. And there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of evidence that at least when it comes to like Christianity, evangelical Christianity, the first great awakening, the second great awakening, these spiritual revival movements that have happened throughout American history really um, have found a way to involve themselves in all of these. They, it, in, the, in the 19th century, religion largely held itself apart from mm -hmm. politics. It saw that as, you know, that's, that's the role of mammon, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's the fallen world. Like, we are about the spirit. And then in the 20th century, because um, norms and conventions changed so quickly. I mean... Mm -hmm. It, it, it so quickly that it would blindside anybody who came from, I mean, think about somebody who, who was born like right around the civil war and died, you know, with world war two going on basically, basically yeah. like the amount of change they saw oh my gosh. and how that destabilized what they considered to be the constraints of society that served them and helped give focus to maybe a simpler and more approachable, more human way of life than a world that is uh, detonating nuclear bombs and uh, creating holocausts and, um, you know, uh, getting into the really, really vicious parts of colonialism in a lot of ways. Um, I can understand some conservatism in that way. Um, but I, oh, I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> I understand. It does, it does seem like, um, there certainly is a at least a, a stereotype of of uh, political conservatism and religiosity it's at least christianity christian religiosity but i Absolutely. i would say the, the politicians they support aren't always the exemplars of their religion yeah which is funny and there's a lot of uh there's a lot of uh, uh shuffling the feet around that sure sure um now i've lost my train of thought <laughs> okay. i was going to we're on equal footing brother i was going to say that it just feels like people need a template. I, maybe not need. People benefit so much from having a template of ideas that they can apply to their life when you run into struggles. And religion often can provide such a template. It, and again, which is maybe why I was so drawn to this philosophy having come straight out of atheism, because I, I still felt spiritual there was still that seed that was planted that just needed to be watered. I just couldn't handle the dogma. And yet here is this philosophy that I'm reading from, you know, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And it, it feels void of judgment. And I'm like, yeah, I can, I, I can, I can use this for a while. And again, that template has helped so much 
it, just to give you an example, my dad, my dad just went to the hospital last night. He's got COVID. It's pretty bad. Oh my and God. I'm sorry. Thank you. It's uh, we're hoping, you know, hoping and praying, oh. but, uh, you know, three years ago, if he had gone to the hospital from my atheist perspective, I would probably be a complete mess right now, you know, with the idea that you've got one life to live after this, you're dirt, that there's no higher plan that just, you know, that's not, I would have to face, if he were to go to the hospital and pass away, I would have to face that challenge alone without a roadmap of maybe what else is possible or without these different, different ideas that might help me survive emotionally or recover emotionally, you know, quicker. So it's just one little thing that I think about that having a template can help so much get through challenges that are, that can be life-changing. If you don't have it, they're going to be life-changing no matter what they can be destructive. If you don't have a template, mm -hmm. they can be destructive, but if you do, it still takes work, but at least you have a different idea set that can help you help you through. Absolutely. And it's also uh, useful to have a community yes. around yes. that template, as long as the template isn't used to order the community, but it, instead it's used as a way to enrich the community and provide the basis for people to learn their own truths, to share them freely without attachment to whether people accept them or not and all that. And I think it's important. Uh, this is something that Kuo also talks about. Um, it's important to recognize how these religions start, right? How these inspirational ideas start. Um, you know, uh, there, there is, they, they do some, um, commentary on Christianity and I would love to, um, read an excerpt that, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we're getting close to closing out or something. I don't know. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's address Christianity directly, especially Carla's, the instruments, uh, relationship to it. Look at the religion that this instrument understands the best for it is her own, the Christian church. It began in the mysticism of the Essenes. The one known as Jesus, the Christ was trained and trained in the Essene way as well as in the scholarship of the Jewish religion. This entity's stories and parables were about simple things, being a peacemaker, understanding that he who loves the prisoner, the orphan, the widow, is loving Jesus the Christ, understanding that he who feeds the hungry is feeding Jesus the Christ. Jesus asked entities to care for each other and to hold all things in common. There was not in any of his teaching instruction on making a church. Indeed, this entity had no home, and during his peripatetic ministry, he walked on dusty trails with very little of worldly goods at all. In his name and in his memory, humankind has created a monstrous, rich, arrogant, political organization with many beautiful buildings, which reach to the heavens with their spires and their crosses. Yet within them there is no virtue, except in the hearts of those who still seek the infinite creator and use those sacred spaces to do so. Love it. Look at any new idea and it is alive. It has a dynamic energy to it that excites people and people want to capture that and pass that on to their children and their children's children. And so they make another building, another religion, another code to try to capture that which cannot be captured. At the same time, you must appreciate what religion has done for entities on planet Earth. It has given the intellect something to gnaw on. In many different ways, it offers people a chance to meet the Creator. Whether you seek within the bounds of religion, or whether the path upon which you walk is one you have created yourself, your very nature demands that you will meet the Creator again and again. Things will happen to you that are meaningful to you personally, and that move your consciousness from one point to another. Whether you are an indigenous entity that has never read a book, an auto mechanic, a college professor, or the most rarefied mystic meditating upon the roof of the world in Nepal or Tibet, you have an equal opportunity to meet the creator upon the road of your everyday life. And what I like about this excerpt that I've read, it was kind of an extended excerpt, a little longer than I wanted to it's go, great. but it really ties in like there's that, there's that uh, uh, irresistible <laughs> pull of that new idea. And that is what is starting these, these strictures, these dogmas. 
if we can hold on to the idea and be a little flexible with the structures that issue from it, that, that, that the sort of other, uh, that, that the human humans inevitably put stuff in, we can even use religions that have become base maybe to us. Let's just be frank. Like a lot of people think that modern evangelical Christianity, modern Christianity has become a base thing, but it's still got that magic in it because it's still got those ideas. If we can focus on the content and not emphasize the form of that content so much, we can work with this stuff in a way that allows us to move forward in our work and consciousness, in our discipline of the personality and in our service, because Whatever you might say about the Christian church, they are spaces where service occurs. And sometimes you are able to have that rarefied kind of service where it really is spirit to spirit and not just, you know, two people uh, debating uh, the finer uh, doctrines yeah. of, uh, yeah. you know, Arianism or, you know, whatever uh, Christian sect, uh, you know, Calvinism, whatever. There were multiple times hearing you read this, I wanted to yell, preach or hallelujah. <laughs> Because I think I think you did at one point. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> I, I said, I love it. <laughs> there, yeah, there are yeah. two points. I'm not going to read them in order because they don't feel in order to me. But I love this section when Quo states, "Look at any new idea, and it is alive!" Exclamation point. It has a dynamic energy to it that excites people, and people want to capture that and pass it on to their children and their children's children. And so they make another building, another religion another code to try to capture that which cannot be captured. Yeah. People get fired up and you're like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. What do I do with all this energy? I know I'm going to build the tallest building I can build <laughs> to honor the yeah. idea. And, and then it's almost a fear of missing out. It is. Or it's a fear how do you, that it needs to capture it and trap how it. How do you share excitement with someone who doesn't feel the excitement you feel? You build the Notre Dame Cathedral. You build, you import all that stained glass. I mean, it's you know, <laughs> what do you, you import all the gold and the the marble for the? That's you know, that's what that's what you do. But I love the previous paragraph where Quo states, "In His name and in His memory, humankind has created a monstrous, rich, arrogant political organization with many." beautiful buildings which reach to the heavens with their spires and their crosses yet within them there is no virtue except in the hearts of those who still seek the infinite creator and use those sacred spaces to do so yes so it is not the buildings that you build out of excitement and passion it's the people that still use that space that seek that seek God, that seek the infinite creator. I love that little section. It, uh, it hits hard for me. Oh yeah. And I just like to follow up, um, and go to the very end of this. Uh, and I think we can probably, uh, wrap up here. Yeah. Um, cause this, this excerpt start, this excerpt starts, this instrument is informing us that we must stop this discussion at this point. <laughs> so we would end with this thought. And this is the thought I want to talk about. You are the possessor of truth, but you do not know that you are. However, the creator is generous in arranging for you within third density an illusion in which nothing can be known, and yet in which you can come to know with a particularly resonant awareness what your path is or what your truth is. You cannot make it happen. What you can do is set yourself up in an environment which is capable of holding, holding gnosis or knowing. Therefore, trust in your own senses, sensings, thoughts, and feelings. As you seek to awaken, to seek, and to serve, listen and look for the resonances that tell you that you are on the path that is for you. Once you start looking for resonance, you will find that the creation is full of information for you. And the more you practice listening, the more you can hear of the voices that are speaking to you in every moment. That is talking about what the constraints leave out, what mm -hmm. they shut out of the picture. And if you can transcend the constraints, if you can say the constraints are useful sometimes, they're not useful other times, how can I serve? How can I learn? 
How can I make use of my experience? Then, friends, religion need be no issue whatsoever, one way or another, whether you, uh, whether, whether it appeals to you, whether it's something that you find uh, uh, grace and uh, purpose in, or whether it's something that you see as too structuring and too limiting. Either of these thing, either in either of these ways, you can use religion, and you can use the the timeless human desire to seek, and to seek in organized ways, or to seek in unorganized ways, as grist for the mill, something that you can learn from, and something that you can grow with. Yeah, I'm amazed at the as the group members question states in the beginning. There's there's truth at the core of so many religions. There are so many similarities, commonalities. And just as an example, before my wife and I moved into our current home, we had some Pakistani neighbors. They've been in the States for maybe 20 years, but uh, I was talking with Amir, my very nice neighbor, and he was talking about going to mosque and one of the lessons that the imam was not preaching, I guess, that not to make, not to try to make heaven here on earth not try to pursue the material goods and all that because heaven is in heaven. You're never going to make it work on earth. And I had just listened to a similar uh, s- sermon from a Christian, from a Christian pastor. It was, I was on YouTube about not trying to make heaven on earth and just a great example of how it's, a, it's a common lesson. It's a common truth, right? That it exists in all religions but no. all religions have their own versions of dogma over time. So it's how do you how do you wipe away all that and get to those get to that core, you know, get to that core in the middle. It's it's one of the reasons that the Lord's Prayer appeals to me so much because there's a lot of moments where they talk about um, uh, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, not my will, Thine, uh, Thy kingdom come. But I, I know that. Uh, that is a work in progress. That is not something mm. that I am going to make That's happen. A chore. And it happens according to your will. And, you know, Muslims also have this way of giving the glory to God too, mm-hmm. right? And giving, saying like, Allah's will be done, you know, if, if Allah wills it. Um, and at the end of the Lord's Prayer, uh, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Which, by the way, that whole part is is seen philosophy 101, mm-hmm. right? Like that... Ate, Makuth, Vegabura, Vegadula, Leolam, Amen. The Kabbalistic cross is coming from the Essenes and Jewish mysticism. Mm-hmm. And it was incorporated into Christianity to give it that new life in the new the the new wine in the new skins, right? Yeah. Um yeah, uh, and I would just uh make one more point, which is that I had uh, briefly hinted earlier that the Confederation gives us a different way than just conforming to a uh, philosophy or religion to explore this inner truth that is locked within us that society and institutions attempt to mediate and, and, and sell back to us. And that is meditation and silence. There is no religion that I'm aware of that you can practice where they would say that sitting silently and clearing your mind is some sort of evil thing. Mm. Not yeah. that I know of. Maybe there, maybe there is a weird snake handling version of Christianity that's like, ah, oh, meditation's bad. No, 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 no. I think, do you know of any? Nope. The, I've even, never even thought of that because it was axiomatic to me. It was just the base level. That's never a bad thing. It, yeah, I've never heard that. I, I kind of want to look into that. Does anybody think that meditation is the devil? You know, <laughs> yeah, like raise your like hand. the water boy, like <laughs> meditation is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, meditation is, and, and, and like in, in the Bible, uh, they often, I think, describe meditation as prayer, right? Again, you're asking. When Jesus prayed for like three days mm, and three nights, yes. I don't think he was actually yes saying words to uh, his uh, father the whole time. Again, I think there was a lot of listening I need to on. read the Bible. I think I need to do my homework there. <laughs> nah, I would just, I would just uh, tackle the New is Testament. There, that's, that's the stuff. There's got to be a Cliff's Notes, right, for the Bible. Is that, is that allowed? <laughs> Am I allowed to do the Cliff's Notes? I, man, 
I mean, I would know. I don't know. Like, I I would I would look at maybe like what Liberty University puts out and see if like they have some uh, cliff mm. notes for their uh, religious courses. They're they're a uh, sorry they're a Christian uh, university owned by the Falwells that's in Lynchburg, oh, Virginia. Okay. So okay, got it. <laughs> um, but uh, I I also think that um, there there there's this really good scholarship on Christianity now. Mm-hmm. Um, that can kind of tease apart the myth from the substance. And so um, why don't we both look for some books where maybe we could like read something that would help expose this body of knowledge to us without us having to make the commitment of not only reading the transcript library, but of reading the old transcript, li- the original <laughs> transcript sure. library, sure. right? Because all that's a lot of that stuff is channeled too. Yeah. Yeah. Oi. Well, Today was good. Got a little heavy. It did get a little heavy. <laughs> got a little heavy, but it was yeah. good. And it's good to get heavy sometimes. It's good because a lot of people deal with this heaviness of the dogma, of the religion, of the of the yeah. organizational aspect, the yellow ray aspect of the spirit. Well, uh, one of the core messages, it, well, I took it as a core message in here, was that the truth lives inside of you and it is protected. That truth exists. And no matter how you fight it, it's going to be there. And so, for example, if you, if the truth is that we are all one, that it's not right to judge others, you know, and be careful even about judging yourself. Um, no matter if that truth exists inside of us, then every time you judge others, it's going to create some dissonance. Some, it's going to create a schism, a little friction maybe. And that friction manifests itself in funny ways. I mean, how many pastors out there are, are gay, you know, but, but, but speak against homosexuality almost, almost as a, as a, (laughs) not just as a cover, but as a counterbalance to the guilt that they feel for the way that they feel. Well, maybe that guilt shouldn't exist because that judgment shouldn't be there. You know, it, so, you know, that's kind of like one example in my mind of what happens when you have a core truth that you just layer on all this, either this dogma or this judgment or something that might not belong there. And so it starts to manifest itself in, you know, in in some crazy way to kind of count, to balance out um, whatever it is you're going through. Yeah. That's the way that catalyst works. That's the way that we program these constraints of personhood, of personality of experience, of life lessons. That's how it all gets balanced. And, you know, is it a shame that people learning their lessons sometimes lead people astray? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But they also have the experience of catalysis too. Well, one thing I'm taking away from today is that I'm going to plant the seed of exploring my own dogma. Dogma that I might not realize is there but something that I take as dogmatic and I don't question and compare that to how I really feel. And I'm going to, I'm going to take that internal friction or schism or any, you know, spiritual friction or energy that I feel kind of as a flag that, Hey, maybe there's a disconnect here between that truth that's inside of me and this dogmatic expression or opinions that I have that maybe I haven't questioned in a while or that I just assume is the truth. Ryan, uh, you and I, my friend, are both opinionated people. We could both benefit from going through this. And, you know, you've often uh, or you've before you've said once that uh, maybe I said it. I don't know. But there is this idea that we're kind of like the Hannity and Combs of Confederation philosophy. Oh. <laughs> where like we have kind of like um, like differing viewpoints yeah. on the world, but we come together on this philosophy. Yes. And so we're able to give kind of like these two maybe sometimes a little bit polarized views of like how this would be implemented. And so like, I agree with you that like, uh, I, you know, I think it's a useful lens, but I think it's also sometimes I don't recognize it as a lens. I recognize it as reality, the way things Mm, are. mm. My, 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 um, rattling off of my critique of institutional science is an example of how I can, uh, have that manifest. So I'm right there with you. Uh, Let me join you on this journey. Yeah, it's a great exercise. I wonder when we get to episode 218, what kinds of, uh, how we'll be looking back at that. Hey, remember that time we had that dogmatic 
uh, episode and, oh boy, I realized I don't like uh, whatever, <laughs> you know. You and I know very well, though, that the real fireworks happen um, when we're not recording. That's true. <laughs> That's true. We have some pretty good combos <laughs> offline. But you and I, I think, like fireworks, so I think it's cool. <laughs> this is true. Well, my friend, it's uh, it's about that time for me to get up the kiddo and get the day going. So should, would you? Yeah, he's really giving you a break uh, today. Um, will uh, you, tell him I'm proud. <laughs> I will. You Would you like to do the honors again? Yes, uh, we had such a great time uh, winging it with y'all and talking about this information. Uh, have a great week and stay in the love and light. <laughs>